Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Mark. I'm a developer advocate at Google. Um, you can find my blog if you're interested at mco.dev. And my um, slides are all available at mco.fyi, which is my short link generator slash gen AI, G E N A I. So, with that, uh, raise your hand if you work on weekend projects. This looks like a bunch of people do. I do too, quite a bit. Um, and I have a theory, actually, about it, which says that every great invention started out as someone's weekend project. There's an actual photo of me last weekend. And um, today I really want to tell you the story of a weekend project. But this project was a little bit different than the ones I've done in the past, because I'm using some technology I haven't used before. And I hope to convince you that the combination of things that I used worked really well in order to realize an idea that I'd had for a long time. To be more specific, uh, back in 2016, I had this grand idea of building an interactive trivia challenge game. Maybe not so grand, but uh, at the time I was excited about it. The biggest challenge, I was trying to build it as a progressive web app to show off some of the capabilities of PWAs. The uh, biggest sort of stumbling block turned out to be sourcing the trivia data. And uh, I never ended up implementing that application. But fast forward to this year, uh, suddenly the landscape changed with generative AI. It became possible to create an unlimited source of content for this app, as well as for many other types of apps. And that's, I think, why people are justifiably very excited about it. Although, um, there's a lot of caveats that come with it, and I hope to go through some of those with you today. So I had this idea earlier this year. Wouldn't it be cool to basically implement that idea I had seven years ago, but have it use some of the latest and greatest cloud technology, and most importantly, have it be turbocharged using this new uh, kind of AI. And so I actually dove in and I created something called Quizaic, which is pronounced like mosaic. Um, it's available to see at the Google booth if you're interested. Um, my partner in crime is Meta Atmel, who is a friend and colleague who's been helping me with it. So. A uh, big part of the credit goes to him as well. So I just kind of want to walk you through the journey that I went on to build this app and share with you what I've learned. I started out with the boring part, which is planning, right? Now the funny thing about planning is I think a lot of people just dive into stuff without really thinking through what they're doing. And I don't want to go off on a tangent where I get all old guy tells you how to do things. But I do think there's an important lesson here, which is to say that even if you're just dabbling in something, just toying with some technology, it really does help to try to answer a few basic questions, like what problem are you trying to solve? If you can't summarize that in one or two sentences, it tells you you're not really focused. And that's okay too, right? Sometimes you don't want to solve a problem, you just want to go in some unknown direction. But for me, I tend to like to have a goal, so this helps me a lot. And then I like to specify requirements. So for example, what's just the minimum set of stuff I wanted to do? I wanted to have some things like uh, be able to have, I'm just going to give you some examples. This is non-exhaustive, of course, but I wanted people to be able to play the game whether they're logged in or anonymous. This notion of the content, I wanted it to be modular, right? So I didn't want to build a thing that generates quizzes based on Google's great new large language model. I wanted to be, um, have a, a separable, extensible thing as the technology changes as in, and as more um, options are available, I can plug and play new generators. I had this idea that unlike a lot of existing quiz apps, 
where the access point for users is equivalent to the quiz itself. I call it a pin here because that's the term I use when you connect to my app. I came up with this idea uh, called sessions. And so the, set, the pins map to sessions, and the sessions are serially reusable. So this is a great example of how you know, the old adage about every problem in software can be uh, solved by adding a level of indirection, and that's exactly what I did here. So not meaning to go through all the details, there's, a, there's a, probably about a one plus page document where I captured these, and that's really the level I recommend is kind of a bullet listy level of stuff and the funny thing about the exercise of doing this is it feels like you're doing it for someone else. We always feel like we know what we're making. We don't have to tell ourselves, but in fact we don't. We think we do. And when you try to set down in words what you're doing, it actually forces you to think through some of the details. And I find that this exercise is actually more about helping you than it is to, about communicating to other people, though it is helpful for that as well. Let's talk about the system design quickly. Um, the system's built on five key data structures. So we have administrators, this notion of um, separable or modular generators. We have, of course, quizzes, which is the content around which we uh, share these, these challenges. We have sessions, which I just described, and we have to keep track of results. There are four different types of uh, users for this system, admins, creators who want to create quizzes, hosts who want to actually run quizzes, and players who participate in quizzes. Um, and this is a model that just shows the relationship between the uh, personas and the, the data sets. I don't even think I need to go through this, but the basic idea is that the admins control or write to all the critical data structures. The creators can write and read quizzes, of course. And players need to be able to read quizzes and read sessions, but they can't write to anything except for results. So we want to have a nice, clear model for how the different personas interact with the different uh, data structures. And that leads to this very simple system architecture where we have a front-end module, web browser, or a mobile application. It's talking HTTP to a web server. The web server, in turn, is talking a HTTP to a back-end API server. And I probably shouldn't have put the product name there, but the API is talking through another interface to the data store. And one key with this application, or this kind of application, is you want real-time updates from the back-end, all the way from the storage engine to the user. So we want uh, a separate path where we can get real-time updates, whether that's done with web sockets or whatever technology is under the hood. We want to be able to have the players of the quiz get immediate and automated updates whenever the um, host decides to change the state of the game in a way that affects the player's experience. So all of this translates to an API. and. This is the definition of my API. As I showed in the previous slide, it's a RESTful HTTP uh, API. And you might ask, well, why do we even need an API? Like, why can't the client just communicate with the database? And the reason is that it turns out to be helpful. I'm sure many, if not all of you, are already aware of this. But it's convenient and uh, important to have an intermediate server that's imposing various policies, typically security and restriction policies, so that you know, if I create a new quiz uh, and I authenticate myself, then someone else can't log in or even access the site without logging in and just delete my quiz or change my content. So having that API is really useful strategically for controlling and managing the data flow. And this is my API that I've implemented. It's quite simple. And rather than talk a lot, I thought I would show you a quick demo. So this is the little welcome screen. When I come over to browse, there's a catalog of quizzes that have already been created. I can do things like, actually, let me start by creating a new quiz. So I'm going to call this Mark's Live talk so people back at the Google booth don't do anything to me accidentally. 
Now in the generator pull down, there are two options right now. Open Trivia is a open source repository of trivia questions. Something on the order of 100,000. Uh, reportedly accurate, uh, I can't guarantee that, but um, this is an example of what I call a static generator. So if you use this, then, uh, and you ask for n questions, it'll just randomly select n questions of the difficulty level that you specify. The second option is called POM, Google Pathways Language Model, which says use an LLM, this particular LLM, to generate the quiz from thin air. So if you switch to open trivia, you get a, an enumerated set of categories that are in this static data set. And if you change your selection to POM, to POM rather, you get a free forum text input. So I'm gonna specify Flemish writers. And we'll leave it multiple choice. Let's do five questions medium difficulty, and let's save that quiz. So we see that quiz is available right here. Now, why is it waiting? What's the deal? LLMs are kind of slow. Um, you probably have noticed this. And uh, one of the reasons is it takes a while for it to think. And uh, instead of having my user interface say, hey, I'm waiting to do something, it'll be done in a minute, please just wait, you can now go uh, play with some other, uh, you know, somebody's creating something called test that's not looking like it's not gonna finish. I wonder if that's an old test by me, so I'm gonna blow it away, which is a little bit brash, but there it goes. Um, anyway. While it's thinking, you can do other things, and that's kind of one of the lessons I learned, is make everything asynchronous and give as much feedback to the user as possible. So here's Mark's live talk. We can take a look at it. Down at the bottom here, we get quiz questions. Um, which Flemish author wrote the novel? Da, I'm not even gonna try that one. Does anybody here recognize that? No one recognizes that book. Is it completely made up out of thin air? How about these authors, are they real? Yes. This is claiming that Felix Timmermans wrote that book. Does anybody know who Felix Timmermans is? Uh-oh. Okay. Well, you might now be seeing one of the reasons why this is a scary technology. Um, how about Hugo Klaus? Yes, Stefan Hertmans. Okay, so we're not sure. But the, uh, we'll come back to this. But I've got a new quiz. It's never been seen before, and maybe for a very good reason. The uh, next thing that I can do is edit my quiz. So I can click the edit button. Well, I I think I just was there because I was just showing you the contents. Um, you can change the content of the quiz by actually hand editing the questions and the answers. So that's kind of nice because the AI will typically do a decent job, but if you actually want to use it for an educational purpose or a real quiz, you probably want to fine tune it, at least for now. Um, and then you can, of course, host a quiz. So I'll just show you what that looks like. Um, I, we won't play it right now. At the end of the session, if we have time, we'll, we'll play one that I think is good. <laughs> um, but the way this works is it pops up this QR code. So anybody who's looking at your screen can take out their phone and connect to the URL. The number of registered players box, actually one person connect or something just to make sure it actually works. Then the first person connects, it will update that registered. Okay, yay. Thank you, Mr. or Ms. Test. We now have one player. And so uh, at some point, I can decide enough people have registered, and I can start the quiz. And it'll start making the questions. And it delivers the questions straight to your phone. Um, lots of people are joining and making guesses. That's cool. Um, and yeah, so it's a typical kind of player experience, but as you'll see it automatically, like if I do next question, 
your phone suddenly jumps to the next question, and that's because of that feedback loop, that real-time update that I talked about earlier. Then I can stop the quiz. And what's kind of cool is, because of this notion of a, a session as an extra level of, of indirection, I can now start another quiz. And if you're still sitting on the, your phone with a connection as you were a second ago, um, wow, somebody's got interesting emojis in their registered player's name. You will actually just pick up where you left off with a new quiz. So that's fun. Um, now, one last thing. Yeah, so the play interface, you enter the pin. Uh, no session available. OK, I probably changed that just before the talk, and I'm not going to try to fix that. But. Uh, it's what you can do interactively if you don't just use the QR code. It'll prompt you for a name you'd like to be known as, and then you're in the, in the app. Um, one thing that I changed last night, which is always a bad idea, by the way, um, is I added this little box at the bottom that says quiz language. And I'm going to generate a quiz in Flemish, which is interesting because I'll have no idea, not only if it's not a good quiz, but even if it's like gibberish. So let's do that. Now the funny thing about this capability is it was 99% tweaking the user interface to add that little language box and to package that field up and send it across that REST API that I mentioned earlier um, and store it in the data store. It was all just getting that language value, managing it, and storing it in the right place. The 1% job was getting the LLM to deal with it and do something useful with it. I basically took the prompt that I'm using. It's a template for a, for a prompt that gets filled in at, at runtime. And I added in language you know, bracketized or braceized, whatever the word is. And of course, whatever you type on that form gets substituted in, and the LLM just says, oh, you want that in Flemish, let's do that. After all that buildup, I really hope this works. Uh, there it is. Drum roll. Is that legal uh, Flemish? OK. Nice. So you can now generate this stuff in any, I'll say, any language in quotes, any language, obviously, that the LLM supports. It probably will break for certain languages or um, other things. But you may notice that I created the language as a freeform text field, not as a dropdown. And that's for two reasons. One is I don't, didn't want to try to enumerate every language in the world. That would be a very long menu. And two is I wanted to allow you to specify non-standard languages like Pig Latin and Pirate Talk. And I think if you even put like in the style of, you might, might get something interesting. But I'm not, gonna try, I'm not brave enough to try that one live. So that's my uh, quick demo. Go back to our slides. OK. And let's talk about some of the technology choices that I made along the way. How many people here have used Flutter? Almost no one. OK. Well, that's really good, because I want, want to tell you about it. Not in an evangelistic way. I just want to tell you how it helped me solve some really important problems. And actually, in one slide, I'm going to explain to you why I love it so much. There's a lot of reasons to love it, but this is the real reason. No, that's not the reason. That's just the home page for where to find out more about it. This is the reason. They've solved this problem where you can have one code base and you can generate an app that looks nice and works well on web, mobile devices, desktop, um, 
lots of, in fact, other, other environments I'm not thinking of right now, but it's a very versatile system and it gives you the ability to not have to do that old drill of investing in a web app and an Android app and an iOS app separately. It also kind of brings some very nice capabilities to the web. If you saw that, you might have noticed there's some animation going on. It has, um, the web app I find has a very nice um, kind of mobile feel to it where it looks almost like and responds almost like the way a mobile app does. So that's my main reason why I like it. I do find it a very interesting um, programming environment. I've been using, they have a, uh, quite a good uh, VS Code plugin extension. And um, it's been a joy to use. It's a very well um, supported and documented system. I was, I put off touching it for a long time. And to be perfectly honest, the reason was I knew that you had to use Dart. And while I don't have anything special against Dart, I kind of felt for a while like, why do I have to learn a new language just to use a framework? There's all these other languages that use frameworks I already know. But to be honest, Dart was like the least uh, obtrusive thing in the picture. I think getting my head around the runtime model and the flow was probably the hardest part. But once you kind of get that, and there's some great resources to help you over that hump, it's a really nice and really productive system to use. And the Dart language just felt like I got it. I just, it felt natural. I think if you're used to Java or C++ or any classical programming languages, you will find it fits well. And it, because it's statically typed and it's not like the kind of craziness of some of the scripted or, un, uh, or uh, dynamically typed languages, it's, there's a lot of nice uh, safety features built in. So you can figure out something's not going to work before uh, runtime. Okay, spent more time on that than I probably should have, but that's been fun. Um, where am I going to do my computing? I have to serve up a web application, and I have to serve up this RESTful API. And I chose Cloud Run for that. And I can summarize that choice in one slide as well. This shows how Cloud Run works when you get a sudden spike of traffic demand. This is an actual... Um, capturing of some metrics on a program I wrote. And uh, the idea behind Cloud Run is you um, containerize your application, put it into a standard Docker container, and then you just kind of throw it over the wall and say, hey, Google, run this container for me and deal with starting up in incarnations of it and taking them back down and only charge me for when it's running. So. I found this. I find this really compelling and really convenient because I can use the same development environment that I'm using locally, and when I'm ready, I just push it to the cloud and off it goes. So that's really been helpful. Um, finally, where am I going to store all this stuff? I've been using Cloud Firestore for that. It's a NoSQL kind of database, hierarchical database, I guess you could say and um, has a nice rich query structure, but probably the most compelling thing about it for this application is that real-time uh, notification feature. So it's very easy to build clients in Flutter and other environments, other programming languages, that will react immediately to changes in the data base. And so that works really well for this app. And as you can see, it has this notion of collections and these collections on the left side are exact implementations of those five data models I showed you in an earlier slide. So for example, here's a session, and you can see it has this pin associated with it, a quiz ID if it's currently running a particular quiz, um, and all the other settings that go along with it, like how many seconds the user should be allowed to respond to this question. Okay, so let's talk about the AI portion. Um, for these generators, I have had a few different ones, and they come in different flavors, right? So I already talked about the static versus the dynamic. There's also multiple choice engines, and there's freeform engine. So a freeform engine is like, what is the capital of whatever country? There's just an answer, you type in a text box. And 
Gen AI can build both types. It's just a function of the prompt you provide. The app currently that I'm showing you now is currently uh, focused on multiple choice, but I hope to add freeform very soon. And in order to make this real, I created a, an abstraction. Actually, Meta, I started it in Meta, made it better, um, where we uh, have a, a Python API that kind of uh, encapsulates the functionality of these generators. So it makes it easy for someone else to build a new generator. And also, we bundled this up into a separate library. And so if you have an app that would benefit from the capability of generating an endless stream of quizzes with all these capabilities, there's going to be a library out there that you can just link into your program and run with. So I wanted to make this, anytime I build something that I feel like there's a sub part of it that could be used by other people, I like to kind of modularize. And so I'm, I've done that. Um, the most important method here, of course, well, you can see you can interrogate the generator, like tell me the formats you support, uh, what topics do you support? And this gives the web front end the ability to dynamically populate those uh, dialogue uh, boxes that we looked at earlier. And of course, gen quiz being the most important one. That's where you say, okay, here's all the specifications for the quiz, create it for me. And this is an example of the palm generator. So it wraps that gen quiz with the basics that I showed you, plus any specific uh, parameters that apply to that particular generator, like the temperature, is probably not meaningful for a static generator, but has important value for the um, Gen AI generators. Um, yeah, so it calls a template or a format function to pass all the templates into the prompt, and then it calls a another function to actually send the request off to the LLM. Uh, it get, gets back some JSON that it pulls and then returns it to the caller. So with that, I can easily extend my system. I use Vertex AI, which is Google's um, generate, generative AI, actually AI support system in general, not just for generative AI. I'm not gonna go into that in detail. I just wanted to show you a little bit of um, some of the capabilities it has. Sorry, that I that I found very useful for this sort of thing. Okay, let me make this bigger. So you can say um, you get this nice environment. I think they call it the Gen AI Studio or something like that. I'm not totally sure. I I should know that, but. Um, Let's say you want to say something like uh, generate a trivia quiz about uh, Flemish writers. And you click submit. You can set a bunch of settings over here, like the temperature and uh, how many um, responses and so on. So it takes a few seconds. This is kind of what I was referring to earlier about this stuff's kind of slow. Um, but it gave me back a quiz that, I don't know if it's any good or not, but it's certainly not in the format that I want, right? So I can say generate a, qu a quiz uh, in JSON format. And so you can see how you can uh, iterate on this process with this interface, which makes it quite convenient. Um, and one of my favorite things about this, <clears throat> yeah, so I got the JSON version, which is nice. Um, I don't like that it's assuming correct answer because I'm using a different string in my program, so I can either adapt my code or, or tell it to do that differently. But I can iterate it on this, get exactly what I want, and then just copy it. And there's a little view code button, which lets me, let's see if this actually works, copy. Let's call this uh, x.py. And took this right from the console. Don't, don't get mad if it doesn't work, because I've not tried this. Fingers crossed. I have all the right packages installed already. 
Um, got an unexpected argument. Let's see. Candidate count. I'm going to just assume something's not up to date there and just try getting rid of that one and try it again. If this doesn't work, I give up on this. But let's see if that goes better. I'm guessing it's going to work <laughs> because it's slow. There it is. So there's my uh, trivia quiz. Um, so that's nice to be able to do that. But um, let's go back to where we were. Whoops. And let's get into some of the lessons that I learned along the way here. A um, couple of general things. So th with, with these um, generative AI engines, what we're finding is it's surprisingly easy to do some hard things. So this was a problem I couldn't figure out how to solve for a few years. I don't claim that I spent that much time on it, but it seemed pretty daunting for a long time. And then all of a sudden, it was easy. Um, but it's surprisingly hard to do things well. And this is something I'm still working on. I'm really at the beginning of this journey. But um, making sure the quizzes make sense, that they don't fabricate information, that they're accurate, uh, that they're interesting and compelling. What does that mean? How do we define it? These are all pretty challenging uh, areas. Um, it's quite hard to objectively evaluate the output. So you get a quiz generated and you want to know how does it look. So we use our human brains and our reasoning and we say, you know, this is good for this reason or bad for that reason. How do we automate that process? Because we really, at the end of the day, need an objective system. The other interesting thing I found in general is I started seeing AI solutions everywhere. It, it's almost like addictive, like, wow, it can do that. I bet it could, I wonder if it could do that. And you start going in lots of different directions. And I think that's fun. And I do think there's a lot of potential there. But um, sometimes I think it can be, we forget that there are other good ways to solve problems that we don't need this fancy new stuff. Uh, prompting is an important area to understand. I don't think everybody needs to become a prompt engineer. But I do think it's a good idea to learn to do some programming in English. Um, this was a real revelation for me when, actually I think the first time this dawned on me was my very first version, I asked for a quiz. And then I started writing code to parse the output and turn it into JSON. And I thought, oh, what if it slightly changes this or changes that? And then like the light bulb finally went off and I said, ask it to give me JSON. And so I did that, and the JSON was buggy at first, and so I had to get more specific. Like, um, I think single quotes are illegal in JSON, so I had to say double quote stuff, and I had to say escape certain characters, you know, so I went down that whole path. So that was like a journey itself, was learning to program in English, how to explain things to these models in such a way to get the outcome you really want. I highly recommend managing your prompts like code. So if you've got a program where you've got some prompts, don't keep overwriting that prompt with the latest and greatest. Uh, make a new version or at least have it in source control so you can go back in history and keep track of like the progression of, of changes you've made in your prompts. And I think this notion that if you can prompt well, you're the new programmer is going way too far. I think at the end of the day, we have to integrate these things with code. And we have to put them into larger applications and frameworks. And I don't think anytime soon an LLM is going to just do all that for us. Like all that stuff we talked about, like what are the requirements? How's the system going to look? How are these different components going to flow and talk to each other? I think it's going to be a while that we're going to need people to, to figure all that out. And so if you can write code and build applications, and think critically about this stuff, I think you're actually more valuable in the LLM era because now you can do more faster. So I see it as an enabler and a, and a kind of a power tool for all of us. 
Um, just an example of some, some prompt use cases. Um, you can, uh, of course, I mentioned this template, the replaceable parts. You can, you, you probably want to be very specific, like, you know, asking for a trivia quiz, it might think it's okay if three answers are correct. It doesn't really know what trivia quizzes necessarily are all about. So you have to be very specific and ask for exactly what you want. Um, I'll give you a good example of that. I was, excuse me, before I figured out this idea of trying to generate the quizzes in a different language, I was giving a talk in Sweden, and before the talk, I added a little bit of text to this because I was sort of in this, like, I wonder if I could generate a quiz in Swedish. That would be kind of cool. So I added just to, like, the middle of the sentence somewhere, I said, in Swedish. This is before the talk, and I ran it, and it worked great. And then I went on stage, and I was, you know, hacking the code right in front of people. So I got a little sloppy. And when I got to this part of the demo, I went to the end of the sentence and added in Swedish just before the period, and it failed. Can anybody guess why? Maybe it's obvious. So I said, generate a multiple choice trivia question containing a trivia quiz containing questions about a topic in Swedish which is inherently telling the LLM, I'm about to give you a topic in Swedish, which I didn't. I gave it a topping in English. I wanted the quiz in Swedish, and I just misplaced where I added those two words. So if I say trivia quiz in Swedish, it works. If I put it at the end of the sentence, it doesn't work. The other thing I discovered is if you have it at the end of the sentence and you put a comma after topic and in Swedish, the LLM gets it. It's like, oh, that's a subjective clause. So that applies to the quiz. Okay, I'll do it. Very subtle, almost like a person, and uh, falls into that category of be really clear and specific about what you ask for. Uh, give examples. This is huge. Uh, before Meto um, joined me in this project, I was telling it every which way how to do what I wanted it to do in uh, JSON. And Meta just said, give it an example, and then the main body of the prompt no longer even mentions JSON, I think. So it's like, this is what I'm looking for. Here's an example. Just do this, and I, you don't have to go into all that detail. So that was kind of nice. Um, another key lesson is it's really important to measure everything. And I say this f going forward because I haven't really done a good job so far of, of this, but I really feel it's critical to the success of these kind of projects. Just like everything else we've been doing in the en software engineering world, we need to monitor the quality of everything, and we need automation, right? We can't just put a new model out there or change a prompt and just hope, you know, cross our fingers that it's going to be good. We also can't just generate a couple of quizzes and go, yeah, this looks great, right? We have to have a framework for engineering. And so the goal is a measurable bench work to work toward. And I'll show you kind of my mental model of what we're going to do here. The first thing is to recognize that there's a couple dimensions of, uh, of metrics that are important. One is accuracy. So is this thing telling the truth? Like when it says answer C is correct, is, it, is that right? And uh, the other is quality. So if it repeats the same kind of question over and over, I call that not such great quality. Um, the quality stuff is a bit more subjective, obviously, but you really want to monitor both of these things. Um, we are working on a hybrid approach to doing this. Uh, I want to explore uh, embeddings as a potentially useful thing. So the idea here would be to take a known data set of facts, trivia questions and facts, and run them through a neural network that embeds them into n-dimensional space. And then we can do the trick that a lot of people do use when they're trying to assess similarity, which is to calculate the distance, cosine distance or Euclidean distance, whatever function we want to use, to say how close are these statements or these these assertions 
to this other constellation of statements. And we might be able to actually have clusters where we have truth, truth and lies and something like that. And this is really just the tip of an iceberg of an idea. I haven't actually tried to do anything like this. So if anybody here is doing this, uh, please let me know. I'm mco at google.com, by the way. So if that or you, I can help you with anything with Google Cloud, let me know. Um, and we're also using the Open Trivia static data set that I mentioned earlier as a corpus for sort of testing this stuff because it's considered to be a large repository of accurate questions. Um, so the validation engine at a high level would take the corpus. It would perturb it in some predictable way. So it would take quiz questions that we know, uh, quiz answers that we know are wrong, make some of them right, um, and vice versa. And then we would prompt run that through uh, a custom prompt for an LLM that says like assess the quality of this quiz or we might even do it on a per question basis where we make each question response pair a separate assertion and the goal is to make sure that the result of that prompt uh, marks all the lies lies and all the truths truths so there's sort of a meta exercise there. And then, and then you iterate at the end to keep improving it based on changing the prompt in the middle. And there's like, an, there's like a goal there of having a meta uh, metric, which is how good is the evaluator at evaluating other generators. And the key here is if you can get something that feels fairly reliable, and I'm not sure what that means numerically, whether that's 70% or what, but if you can get something that seems fairly reliable, then you can run your generators through it and assess like this generator is better than that generator at the moment. Or you can um, fine tune your prompting. You can change your prompting. Like I just added a prompt that said, spit this out in whatever language the user asked for. Oh, the accuracy of my quizzes after generating 10,000 quizzes went from 0.83 to whatever. So I now have a framework with which to measure my progress, which is really important. Um, this is showing how you might take that idea and actually integrate it into the product. So you could imagine the generator goes through the LMM, generates a quiz, and then it sends that on the fly, right in that moment, to a validator. And the validator does the same thing that I showed you in the previous slide, gets validation results, and then the app can say, this quiz has been marked with a, you know, you should, a color-coded thing maybe, like, yeah, this looks trustworthy, or this is questionable, or, or don't even bother with this quiz. Um, that kind of thing could be, could be really useful, because another thing about these LLMs is they're not, they're just not deterministic. I don't think they're ever going to be, de sorry, I don't think they're ever going to be deterministic. So I think we're always going to be playing a probabilistic game where we say, I think the confidence level on this quiz is point x x x. So, um, yeah. Uh, a couple other quick lessons. I just went through that. Um, an example of this non-determinism is every once in a while you can get bad JSON, even though we give it this great example. Every once in a while it gets confused and misses a comma or something. If you have a comma at the end of a the last element of an array or a, or, a, or a map, I think JSON doesn't, isn't happy with it. So um, the strategy is to run the quiz through a format validator and on the fly verify that it's legal. JSON, if it fails, try again and just keep the user informed and log the events so you can tell how often this sort of thing is happening. So these are all standard software engineering practices, but they're really important when you have this system that you call and you just have no idea what's going to do at any moment. I talked about this earlier. I like to say, how many people does this phrase make any resonance with 2400 baud? Okay, some of my old, older, I won't say older, some of my buddies out there. Um, we are living in the 2400 baud modem period, by which I mean this stuff's all new, and we're really all figuring in this out collectively how to make it run at an acceptable response time. It's generally pretty slow, and that leads to a bad user experience. All the old tricks that we've know, known about for a long time help here. So batching as many things into, into one request is helpful, except if we get to the point where the, the prompt is so burdened that you know, we're, we're harming the quality. 
Um, doing things asynchronously, doing as much in parallel as possible, and caching helps. But I'm very optimistic this is going to get better over time because everybody wants to solve these problems. And finally, don't overuse the hammer. So, you know, that phrase about when you've learned how to use a hammer, everything looks like a nail. Try not to make this in that, fall into that trap. Um, an example is I've been trying to figure out how to grade free form answers. So, you know, the answer is George Washington. I have to support Washington and George W and all these variations. And I started going down the path of, ah, another opportunity to use AI. Embeddings. I love embeddings. I'm going to build embeddings and I'm going to see what's the distance between this answer and the actual known answer. And again, Meta, who often um, saves me from myself, uh, said there's this thing called fuzzy matching. Let's try that. And he built something and um, I think it's going to work really well. We haven't tried it yet, but I think it's going to be super easy and super effective and it avoids me having to build a whole infrastructure just to grade freeform answers. So don't reinvent the wheel. Not every problem requires all this cool stuff, even though we're tempted to use it because it's fun. I have lots more to do. Build a better evaluator, improve the quality. I already talked about all this stuff. I want to finish the UI. I put quotes around that because what's ever finished. And I'm going to build some tutorials and open source, <laughs> open source all this stuff. I'm talking fast because I'm down to five minutes. To summarize, um, I wasn't working on this idea for seven years, so I, want to make, I don't want to make it seem like it suddenly um, improved my productivity from seven years to seven weeks. But I wasn't working on it because it was too hard. So in a very real sense, and because I procrastinate a lot, but in a very real sense, um, this made all of a sudden became possible. And once I did start it, in seven weeks I had a pretty good working prototype. Why was I suddenly able to realize this dream? Um, the AI revolution is probably the biggest reason, but there's another reason, which is sort of the un, unhighlighted, but I think also important message of my talk, is I discovered that Cloud Run plus Vertex AI plus Cloud Firestore plus Flutter is a real win for me. I feel like, and I'm not being a marketing person, I'm being a developer who's done a lot of this for a long time, I feel like the, I finally found this collection of tools with which I can do almost anything. And I even came up with a arguably forced uh, thing here. It's like, you know, like the lamp stack and so on. Um, it's, I call it the riff stack. And so uh, I think I can do anything with the riff stack. I always think I can do anything, which is a problem, but uh, it's been fun. And so I hope, hope that was helpful for you. And uh, I'll take any questions. Do we have like three minutes? But anybody have any questions? Not hearing it. I can't really see you all that well, so yell out if you have something. If not, I'll just let you out three minutes early. Okay, I'm going to be down here, and I'll be milling around. So if you want to talk afterwards, come down. I'm mco at google.com if you want to talk offline, questions and whatnot. And thank you very much for, for joining me this afternoon. I hope you have a great conference.